Hi and welcome to Neat AI. So this is the Boyd implementation I've been working on for the past couple of weeks. I've prettied it up and stuck a quad tree on it, which is what we'll talk about today. The thing about Boyd's is that you can never have enough of them. You start with 10 just to get things going, and code up the basic interactions. Then you want 20 to see more detail, then it's 50, then 100 to get a decent sized flock. Then it's 200 because of course you want multiple flocks, throw some predator boids and object avoidance into the mix, and you're up at 400. Then you'll want a thousand, and before you know it, you'll be watching YouTube videos of a million boids flocking about in 3D. But realistically, on my old PC, if I can get a few hundred running smoothly, I'm quite happy with that. The problem, of course, is the fact that each Boyd needs to know something about every other Boyd. In particular, it needs to know if it's a neighbor. And to do this, it needs to check in with every other Boyd, effectively asking how far away you are and checking if it's within a predefined distance. If it is, then it's close enough to affect the vector components of the Boyd and influence its position. And the problem with this approach is, of course, that it doesn't scale very well, as the number of checks you need to do is proportional to the square of the number of Boyds that you have. So if you only have 10 boids, and that's 100 checks, 50 boids is 2,500 checks, and well, you can see the problem. By the time you get up to 1,000 boids, you'll need to do a million checks to determine who's your neighbor. And that's for every frame, and you then still need to do the coherence, separation, and alignment calculations. The basis for my implementation was the Ben Eater Java code, which works great for the 50 boids on screen, but it does take this naive approach. In fact, it does the same, are you my neighbor, check three separate times. It does it once in the coherence function, once in the separation function, and again in the alignment function. So an easy improvement to his code then would be to just do the vector component calculation loop once across all voids. And that certainly helps, but is there faster methods for determining who your neighbors are? Turns out there are. One is the quad tree method, which we'll talk about today, and the other is spatial hashing, as pointed out in the comments by Typical Hog. Both methods can be used to reduce the number of collisions in a 2D plane, and I want to compare them to see which works best with a Boyd's type setup to improve performance. In this video, I'll focus on the quad tree approach. So what is it and how do we use it in Boyd's? Well, essentially it's an object for storing data. Running now on screen is an object capturing the locations of circles and storing that data in a node. The node has a predefined limit, which I've set to 5. And as each node reaches capacity, it branches and produces 4 offspring. Each of the offspring nodes will also have a capacity setting, and once reached, they too will branch and produce 4 offspring of their own. And this continues recursively subdividing into 4 quadrants until all data points have been assigned to a node. A side-on view makes it a bit easier to see what's happening. As I add circles to the tree, they are added to the top-level node until its capacity is reached. As another circle is added, the top level parent is forced to branch into four new quadrants, each of which also has the same capacity as the parent. All nodes have width and height dimensions and have the ability to split. Every time a circle is added, the quad tree uses an insert function to store it. This function starts at the top parent level and works its way through the layers until it can add it. In this way, the quad tree can hold all of the points and it doesn't matter whether they represent circle coordinates or void locations. And what you end up with is an object that you can pass a range to, normally in the shape of a rectangle or circle, and it will return an array of indices to points that exist in that range. It does this by asking each node in each layer in turn if it has any relevant points. If it does, then they get added to the returned array. For our Boyd's example, I pass it a rectangle, send it around the Boyd's position, which represents its visual range. I've allowed each boy to have its own visual range and its size is dependent on the number of neighboring boys it can see. I set it a predefined target of about 10 boys, and if it can see less than that, then it will start to increase its range with each frame. And if it can see more, then of course it will decrease it. I'm displaying the visual range for one of the boys so you can see it in action. This works a lot better than just having a fixed range for all boys, as it can result in having way too many neighbors, which in turn means it has a lot more calculations to do and is required for boy behavior to emerge. In fact, all you need is between 5 and 10 neighbors for each boy to interact with to get some realistic flocking behavior. Which makes sense, as in real life birds will stay close to their immediate neighbors while at the same time avoiding them. 
and aren't too concerned with the hundreds of birds they can't see. A typical example that gets used to demo this would be checking for collisions or overlaps in shapes. Each shape needs to check every other shape to see if an overlap has occurred. If it has, then I get the code to highlight those shapes. This again will suffer in performance as I increase the number of shapes as the relationship to the number of checks required is proportional to the square of the number of shapes. Of course, there are ways to optimize this. If shape A intersects with shape B, then by definition, shape B must intersect with shape A, and so on. And you can see that in action here. I draw a group of circles on screen and then get every circle to check if it overlaps any other circle. For this setup, it's fairly straightforward. If the distance between the center of two circles is less than twice the circle radius, then they must overlap, as all circles have the same radius. I fill in the circles if they overlap, and if the distance is greater than twice the radius, then they don't overlap and I leave them alone. That's the standard approach, and for the quad tree option, when it's selected, it passes a circular range to the tree object and gets back an array with the reference to any points inside that range. The center of the range, of course, is located at the midpoint of the circle it's checking, and its radius is again twice that of the circle. And it will do this for every circle on screen. And as these circles aren't moving, I only need to update the quad tree once to populate the object. I have the option of switching the quad tree on or off and display the frames per second each method is managing to achieve. As the number of circles goes up, this will decrease and you can see the difference between the two approaches. By the time it gets to 1500 circles, well, the basic approach is struggling to achieve 5 frames per second, but the quad tree method is still managing a number in the mid-20s. Of course, as our boys are moving all the time, we need to populate the quad tree with their new positions on a regular basis. Failure to do so would mean the boys would never know where their neighbors are. But how often do we need to update it? Ideally, we do it every frame, but as we're going for speed, there's always a trade-off. Trying it once per second, and you get this pulsing effect. Every half second, and it's better, but still not quite right. On my system, about once every 100 milliseconds seems to work just fine. So how do you code up a quad tree? The easiest option is to hop over to the Coding Train channel and watch a couple of the videos he's done on the topic. It's a detailed walkthrough, but there's not much code to write. It takes about 20 minutes to complete. That's it for now. As always, thanks for watching.